intro on Melvin. Melvin is from uh, various uh, NUS things. I think it's safe to say NUS. Um, and how do you pronounce Margarina again? Major Arena. Major Arena. Sorry. I've read this Margarina and I'm stuck in my head. Um, so Major Arena, I think, is a open source uh, software version of a card game. Yeah. From what I understand, and he's going to be talking to us about how to get uh, machines to do what we love doing, which is play computer games. So it should be fun. So I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for a very kind introduction, and thank all of you for being here for this talk. Um, so, uh, I'll talk about Mage Arena at some point, but uh, I thought I would make it a bit more general and talk about how uh, various different uh, open source game AI projects work beneath the hoods. Get into a little bit of the sort of computer science uh, as well as talk about why the projects are successful and what makes them work. So, this will be my talk. Um, so let's go. Right, uh, yeah, this is a picture from a game I played when I was a child. So, how do you play games here? Do you play games? Alright, good. Okay, so. The general idea, as you may have heard, is to get computers to play games, right? As good as people. And this turns out to be a very old idea. Like, I think maybe you can trace it back to even um, Alan Turing sort of developed a, a, an algorithm for chess, but he had to play it uh, in his head because you know, there, were no, there were no machines back then. So he simulated uh, the moves of the, the algorithm in his head. It takes him like a half an hour to make one move because he, he ran through his algorithm. Uh, but this is an early... Uh, program called Bell Chess. It was on the Amiga, but I played it on the PC. And it sort of gave me the impression that, wow, you know, the computer is actually better than me at chess when I was you know, like a small kid. So how do they do that, right? So that, that's the question. Um, and of course, you know, games are a good test bit for thinking about problems because they're very clean and abstract models. So for, especially for beginners, I think, looking into you know, AI, games is a good way to get started. And uh, so one of our early you know, breakthroughs, I think, in, in this area is in chess. And I realize now, this has been a long time, this was like 1996, more than 20 years. And the, the match was between the computer, which is Deep Blue, and uh, Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion at the time. So Kasparov was sort of uh, representing the best of the human chess play, the chess grandmasters. And if you were around that time, uh, you would remember that, I think they played um, two series of matches. So actually in the first series, uh, Kasparov won, so IBM said, let's do a rematch. And Kasparov said, okay. And then in the second series, unfortunately Kasparov lost. So actually he sort of, he win one and he lost one. But then, you know, IBM said, oh, you know, who has won Kasparov? Okay. And Kasparov says, let's do a third match. And so IBM says, no. <laughs> you know, it's good to leave it on a high note, right? At least for Deep Blue. Uh, in case you haven't you know, wondered what Deep Blue looks like, I, I did some research for this talk, and uh, this is what Deep Blue actually looks like. It's actually not that amazing. It just looks like it's like a desktop, but it's a bit large. So he has a, it's actually a massively distributed system. You have many nodes, and they also have specialized uh, chips that were designed to, to play chess. And today, actually, you can get a program from the internet that is much better than Deep Blue, even on your Android phone, right? Uh, and this is called Stockfish, I'm not sure you can see the last line. Okay, so that's where you can find Stockfish. This is an open source project, uh, C++, GPL v3. And if you look at the rankings of chess programs, Stockfish is the highest, uh, or the most powerful chess program. It has ELO points of upward of 3,000, 3.3,000 ELO points, which is the human grandmasters of about 2.8. So this is the, um, so the, the best of the best. And the surprising thing if you look at the list is that all the other programs are proprietary programs. So a lot of the people who join all these computer chess competitions, they like to, well, use proprietary programs because otherwise the other programs next year could borrow your ideas and, you know, win you, right? So it's kind of surprising, right? Stockfish being an open source and it's the only open source program in the top five and it could be actually the top, right at the top of the uh, computer chess. So how did it do that? Uh, before that, let me tell you how the stockfish actually work. Like, how does it find like the best move for chess? So I can go into a little bit of uh, theory, but with pictures. So uh, if you look at this image, it shows you the game of tic tac toe because chess is sort of way more complicated. But I'll just show you tic tac toe because it's easier. And the central abstraction that uh, we use in these programs is something called a game tree. And what is a game tree? Basically, you have the um, the positions of the game, they are the, the nodes, and then you have the edges, meaning that you can make a move 
to go from one of these positions to the other one. And it's kind of like, I guess if you look top to bottom, it's going from the beginning and then you, you, you make more and more moves. It's like, you know, the X makes a move and then the, you know, the circle makes a move, right? So you can see here you have two levels. So, uh, but of course the game goes on for many more levels. So this is a very important idea. Okay, so uh, let me introduce something called optimal play. So let's think of a very small game. So in computer science, we like to work with small problems so that we can understand the, the situation. So let's think of a game where you only have two players. We we'll call one of them the max player and the other player the min player, right? So the first move is made by the max player. The next move is made by the min player. And then the game is over. Okay, so it's a really simple game. And each player only has two options. Which is, that's why you see two edges leading out of the nodes. So you can visualize the whole game just on this tree. Right? So the game has four possible outcomes. Right? Because each player has two moves, and then there are a total of two moves. So it's two times two, that's four. Okay. And then let's label the nodes, right? So we'll take a convention that um, we'll label the node one if it's the max player wins. Okay? So let's see why it's the max player. And we'll label the node zero if it is the min player wins. So we just assume there's no draw. So either the max player wins or the min player wins. So this game is kind of biased towards the max player, actually. The max player wins three out of four times. Okay. But this is at the, at the bottom, right? So now we want to work backwards. So if you're the min player, so what would be the, 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 the number, right? So if you're the min player, you can actually see that um, at the, after one move, actually um, the min player would win. Right, so in this particular node, I labeled it zero because in that uh, node, the min player can choose to go to the right. right. This is the min player's turn, and then that's the place where the min player wins. Right, so that node itself is going to be zero. Or you can think of it that way. We look at the we look at the connected nodes. We choose the smallest number because I'm the min player. I want to go to a small number. Right, that's the intuition. For the other side, unfortunately, both are ones. So the smallest number I can choose is a one, which is actually a loss for the min player. So at the at the very high, at the very first node, the max player, of course, you would choose the, to go to the right, right? Because when you go to the right, the, all the outcomes lead to the max player winning. So you can, in this way, you can sort of work backwards and figure out at any point in the game who is going to win, right? So mathematically, actually, you can say at every point in the game you know who is going to win, even in a game like chess. Right? But it's just that, the, well, what's the problem? So chess has uh, a very, very big tree, right? So uh, it has 10 to the 46 states. So the states are the circles. So the 10 to the 46 circles, or you know, for people uh, who do programming, maybe you can say 2 to the 153 circles. So it's a very, very huge number, right? So if you walk backwards and, and, and go to the beginning, you're going to go through all these 2 to the 153 states. Right, which is, it will take a long time. So we don't do that. But people actually do that for, um, they go up a few levels. They don't go all the way to the beginning. It's like called chess end games, but that's all I'll say about that. People actually study these games. Um, but we, don't, we can't go all the way to the beginning, right? Because it's so big. Okay, so what do you do, right, if the problem is so big? Uh, so this is how I showed the, the very, very big tree. So there's the, the, the note, and then I have this triangle, which so just shows like the millions and millions of nodes below because there's 10 to the 43, right? Because, like, I can't draw all of them on the screen, so I'll just show them as triangles. Um, so the answer is, that's very simple. So since I only have a small amount of time to make my move, I will not go all the way to the bottom because it takes forever, right? So I will just choose a level and just say, I only go like two levels. In this case, in this example, um, the computer will only consider the future uh, for two moves, right? So this is the, the, the future moves. I only consider two moves. So I make a move, and then you make a move, and then that's it. Then we'll, we'll just ignore the rest. Okay, so when we do that, uh, this is called a mean max algorithm. So it's very important. This is a very standard thing you, you, you would learn. And then, um, so previously remember, we gave the numbers zero and one, right, at the bottom. Because when the game finished, we know who wins, right? So now we have a problem, because at this level, two moves, the game isn't finished because you know chess takes many many moves to finish the game, right? So after two moves, the game is not complete. So we actually don't know who wins. Okay. So the and here's where sort of the heuristic comes in. So we gotta have some method of giving a number 
to an incomplete game. So the game is sort of halfway through. We're going to look at the, the board, look at maybe how many pieces you have and so on, and give it some kind of uh, score. If we call this a heuristic score. And if, if you look at the board and we, we think that the max player is going to win, we give a number close to one. But it wouldn't be one exactly, because we can't be sure. And if we think the, you know, let's say the max player is the player playing black, because in chess you have to play black or white. And the white player is the main player. If the white is going to win, we, we give a small number based on some sort of heuristics, rules of thumb, right? So let's say we give the numbers this way. Uh, so we give numbers like that. So 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.6, and 0 0.9. Right? These are not 0 or 1 because we don't know for sure who is winning. We look at like the, you know, whether you have more pieces and so on, right? Look at the position and the, and the material advantage uh, you have in the board. Okay, so assuming we do this, then we can perform actually the same method we did just now. So the exact same algorithm would work. So what will happen, right? So we'll know at the two levels down, and then we work our way, we work our way backwards. Right? So the min player here would be uh, a 0 0.1, because I will choose the, the right-hand side, right? Because I, well, I want the smallest possible. And then here would be 0 0.6, because I go to the left. And then for the max player, the number at the top is 0.6, which means the max player should make the move on the right-hand side, right, going to the right, because this gives me a better outcome. Does that make sense? Okay, if not, you can ask me questions later. Um, all right, so this is how it works. Okay, so this is a basic idea, but there are many, many improvements you can make to this idea. So for example, how do you calculate these, uh, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.1, all that, right? This is the heuristic, I didn't say how you actually do it. And um, here, I also make it very simple, I say I only consider two levels, right? But maybe you don't want to consider all the nodes to the same um, level. Maybe some, some parts of the tree is more interesting, right? Then I consider it deeper, and some parts are more sort of obviously bad moves. I don't want to consider that part of the tree. And one of the problems actually in developing this software you find is that it's actually very, very hard to test changes. And something that I don't see a lot of people talking about. So the issue here is let's say you know you're a contributor to Stockfish, you want to say, you know, so you look at one of the words, it's a bit small. So it says uh, more weight for pawns in initiative if both flanks are active. So this is to do with the heuristic score, right? So maybe there's some weight, some weightage, some number for pawns. And maybe instead of the number being 0.7, I'll change it to 0.8 in the way we do the scoring. But you know, Stockfish is already a very good piece of software, right? It's already very powerful. So how do you know if you change this heuristic number from 0.7 to 0.8, would it make it better or worse? Right? Like nobody knows actually. Like there's no way to tell. So the only real way to do it is to run sort of thousands and thousands of games with one version of Stockfish using 0.7 and another version of Stockfish using your proposed change, which is 0.8. Right? And we let them fight each other, right? Make them make them play chess over and over and over again. Uh, and this is what this system does. It's a distributed testing system. So one other way you contribute to Stockfish, it's like all the ways you've heard so far, is that you can contribute CPU time. You can join this distributed testing uh, system and use your computer to, to simulate Stockfish. So different versions of Stockfish, essentially. The, the original version and the version with some change proposed by a contributor. So after they play, we have to play many, many games because the, the, the effect is very small. So maybe you have to play like a thousand games and then this one win once, one more time than this one. You know, because the effects are quite small. And then that's how they actually judge whether something is an improvement for the project or not. And this turns out to be the, really the key idea why Stockfish is number one in computer chess. Because rather than debate endlessly about which is better, right? We just perform this test and we know for sure if your change is good or bad, whether it makes the, the, the program stronger or not. Right. So this is a very, very important thing. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, move on to a different domain, different game now. So I said about this heuristic, so I mean, like, how do you weightage, what's the weightage of a pawn versus a king and a queen and so on, right? So of course you can use the, the fish test and, and test different values. 
But it turns out that for some games, it's actually very hard to even give a formula for the, 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 the heuristic score. But chess turns out to be relatively easy to do that, which is why chess works quite well. So what, what kind of game is that? So for example, the game of Go, right? the game of Go was um, big in the news one year ago. Uh, so Go is this game, uh, you're playing with also black and white pieces, and then, but they're they are all the same, so they just have these Go stones. And then the general idea is to try to occupy as much territory as possible. So this is like troops, and then try to place these troops in a connected fashion to occupy territory on the board. But if you surround the other, you know, the other opponent, then you sort of capture all of these pieces. So this is the sort of simple idea of Go. In fact, Go is a bad idea in the game, so you should, you should go look at how Go works. Um, so if you follow the, so what's the corresponding to Deep Blue, right? In Go, there's this program called AlphaGo, developed by the Google DeepMind team. And uh, almost exactly, well, this is just slightly more than one year ago, AlphaGo, uh, developed by Google, played a match against, well, played a series of matches against Lee Sedol, who is the, one of the top Korean Go players. And if you follow, you will remember that, well, again, this is a big news because AlphaGo won. Right, so I think AlphaGo won like four out of the five matches. So how does AlphaGo you know, play Go, right? Because as I said, one of the games where you can't construct this heuristic score is the game of Go. Because even if you ask an expert sometimes in the, when the game is incomplete, it's very hard for them to tell you which side is winning. Because the way the board works is that a small change in one part could affect the other part of the board. Because for example, if you put a piece and connect two sections of the army, so when they're connected, they're actually more powerful. Yeah, so that's why it's, it's very hard for Go. Because one small little piece can, can connect together a much larger group. Okay. Uh, and before I tell you that, let me tell you about what... AlphaGo, unfortunately, is not open source. Uh, and I doubt it would be open source anytime soon. Uh, or you might need a huge uh, compute cluster to run it, uh, which will also be quite expensive. Um, what we have for today uh, is some other programs. So I'll talk about one of them, which is called Pachi. Uh, on this website, and Pachi is written mostly in C. Uh, Pachi implements the same basic algorithm as AlphaGo, and also recently incorporated this um, uh, neural networks that AlphaGo actually uses. Okay. So let, let's see what was the basic um, algorithm. So coming back to the game tree the pictures we saw. So back to the old friend, the game tree with many, many nodes. So Go has many more nodes than chess. I don't remember how many, but much more. So we have the same problem, right? But as I said, we have no good way to assign the numbers to the, the nodes at the sort of the cutoff, right? So we don't know how to give the numbers. So what do we do? So it's a very simple and elegant idea actually from, I guess, our statistics, right? So we don't know which, which future is possible. So what we'll do is we'll um, sort of have the computer make random moves from the, uh, one of the, the, the positions make random moves for both sides, and eventually the game will be finished. Because if you keep randomly placing pieces, the board will be filled up, and then the game is over, right? And when, when the game is over, you can count the territories and know who actually won, right? Because that's not how we know someone wins. When the game is over, it's, it's obvious. So let's have the computer make random moves until the game is over, okay? But of course, if you think that oh, it's just gonna be random result, right? But we do that many times, that's, that's sort of the trick. So we do that, you know, like a thousand times. And the, the intuition is that, um, let's say if white was in a very strong position, then if you complete the game in this sort of random way, white tends to win more often if white was originally in a very strong position. Okay, so, so think about that. Um, so that's what it does. We make random moves and then we gather the statistics, right? Who wins more often? After we do like, you know, like a, a thousand different random um, plays. We play all the way when to the game is over. Then we can use the statistics to calculate this number. So instead of looking, just looking at the board, looking at the pieces, we actually make moves and complete the game. And when the game is complete, we can know who wins for sure, right? So we do that for uh, all the nodes and so on. Okay, but it doesn't have to be very slow if you do it like that, because you're going to make many, many, many moves, uh, many, many random moves for every node at the bottom, right? We should not have to be quite slow. Uh, which is why people came up with this concept uh, called Monte Carlo Tree Search. This is um, sort of a, a very refined idea. And instead of making 
uh, many many random moves. We just make one random uh, random sequence of moves. It is called a simulation in this case. So they call making these random moves simulation. And when you do a simulation, you get either a win or a loss because you play the game until it's finished, right? And then you take that uh, either win or loss and um, update the statistics of all the parent nodes. It is called back propagation. And then we go back to, okay, so I'll tell you what the selection and expansion is. So this is to do with which part of the tree we want to expand. Because as I said, the tree is not all equal. Maybe one of the moves is a really bad move that we would never want to make, right? Because your tree has, let's say, you know, let's say 10 different uh, options, right? So one of them could be like a really bad move. So we, we never want to, we will actually never go there in real life because nobody makes this silly move, right? So we want to spend most of our time on places where it's sensible moves, right? What, what goal experts would actually play, right? So how do we do that? So this is why, this, that's what these two steps does. So the selection step tells the, the system where should I explore next? Which section of the tree should I go follow? Right? These are basically the possible future, right? And then when, when I go to the bottom, I will increase the size of the tree by one node, and then just, just do one simulation. Just do one, right? And then do all the steps again and again. So keep repeating these four steps, right? Um, okay, so and then Go also uses neural networks, which I have no time to explain what they are, but the neural network generally is done to help in selecting the good moves. So don't even have to go to the lousy moves. So this is pretty similar to a NAN instruction, right? So because in the simulation step, you're actually testing it, and then depending on how the result is, you're back propagating. Right? So this is similar to a neural network or something. Uh, you can say it's similar in that sense, but it's quite different, I would say, quantitatively, if you think about it. it. It does do a simulation, but a simulation is random in some sense, right? So it's not really giving you a, a concrete, it's not really a test case where you say, does it match the test case, you know? Yeah, it's right, quite different in that sense. Propagate based on the result you get or something, right? This one does do back propagation, but it's not really like updating the parameters. Yeah. It's more like updating the statistics. Yeah, how many times I won versus how many times I lost. Yeah. So that, that's the difference, okay. Uh, and then, okay, as I said, go use neural networks to, to reduce the, the search further. Uh, but unfortunately, no time to talk about that. Uh, okay, so last part, uh, third game I'll talk about, because we're running out of time. Um, third game is a game of hidden information. So the two games I've shown you, chess and go, the, the commonality is that you can see everything happening in front of you. There's no secrets. So a lot of games have secrets. So particularly this game, uh, this is a game called Magic the Gathering. Uh, this is a picture of the Grand Prix Singapore 2015, the URL was cut off unfortunately. And you can see the uh, player there has a number of cards which he can see, but the opponent cannot see. Right? That's quite common in, in card games. So another game like that is poker, for example. Uh, but I'll talk about magic because you know that's my project. Uh, and this is a project that I've worked on for a uh, number of years, uh, written in Java, uh, also GPLv3. Unfortunately, the website's cut off, but you can Google this word. Uh, so this is a project called Mage Arena. It implements uh, the Magic Gathering game uh, on the desktop, and again, it has this AI where you can play with the AI. So, so I'll tell you a bit more about it because it's my project. Uh, <laughs> this is how it looks like. You know, like we have a unlike most of these other engines. If you look at all the chess and Go engines, actually they usually have no UI because UI is done by some other program. But for us, we do everything in one program, so you come with a UI as well. So this is what it looks like. Okay. Uh, okay. So you ask me, so how do we do with this? Because now you cannot see the cards, right? Because I don't know what cards you have because you just like like that. So how do we still perform the four steps, right? And essentially, the problem is how do we perform? I'll talk about how do we perform simulation, because as you remember, simulation means uh, we make random moves until the game is over, right? But I don't know what you have in your hand, right? So you can make some move from something in your hand, but I don't know what it is, because how do I do simulation, right? It seems to be a very tough problem. In fact, we struggled with this for, for one year. There was one issue that's open for one year about how do we how do, we do this? Because what, what we did initially was very simple. We, we, we imagined that the AI has uh, like uh, x-ray eyes. If the AI has x-ray eyes, they can see everything, like the ones in your hand and the ones at the table, okay? Because that was the easiest way to get things to work, right? But our first players were complaining, hey, you know, the AI is kind of cheating and all that. So, so there was this issue for one year trying to solve this. 
Uh, okay, how we solve this turns out to be not that difficult actually. Uh, I was quite amazed. So what we do if we think about the random moves is the future is very, very complicated because so many different options, right? So by making random moves, we sort of explore one possible future, right? Or we call this sampling in statistics. And we can do the same actually for the hidden information. Because for the cards that we don't know, we will just pretend to fill them in with some possible cards based on what you've seen and then what they have, you know that, well, what they have is a, is a possibility, right? Because the, the, all the cards are like this, and you've seen some on the table, so what they have is, is the rest. We, we don't know how is it arranged and all that, we'll just put in some random ones, okay? So this is like also sampling the, the random possible um, hidden information. Because the hidden information is like a set, because we, we don't know the actual one, we know it's sort of this cloud. Well, we, prob we probably have this, or this, or this. So we just choose a random instantiation. We just instantiate the hidden stuff with some random uh, possibility. One of one of the random possibilities, right? It's just like playing random moves, right? Random moves means we explore one possible future. So here we explore one possible uh, element from this random set of uh, hidden information. So with that, we can actually perform simulation because now we have actual cards, right? Not no no more secret cards. We have actual cards, but it's not. The real things in the hand is just one of the random uh, instantiations. In terms of being good enough to, to perform the rest of the steps, just this one trick. Okay, um, so that's how we deal with random information. But this is, of course, just a very um, small hack or a small trick. It's not really very effective. There are actually more effective ways that people have discovered, especially in the, when they deal with poker. Uh, but that's the for future work. Okay, so let me just summarize quickly because I'm running out of time. Uh, what did I talk about today? Um, so I talk about the theory side of it, and there's a, there's a couple of um, principles or, or you know, basic algorithms that this game playing program is used. The idea of optimal play, right? Counting backwards, we met, right? We cut off at a particular point and we assign not zero and one, but some number in between, and we can still apply the, the, the inference backwards. There's this idea of Monte Carlo tree search, which is the random moves. And then last part is about sampling the hidden information. And in practice, if you want to contribute to some of this software, these are the open source projects. You have Stockfish, which is the best chess playing program. Um, Pachi is one of the top two best chess playing, uh, best Go playing programs available. It also uses uh, Monte Carlo tree search. And um, Major Arena, of course, is uh, the project I'm involved in. Uh, is this multi color tree search plus it takes care of the hidden information, right? Use the cards you don't see. Okay, so that's uh, in the slides, you can find it on the slide share website. Yeah, so that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Melvin. Thanks, <laughs> Arena. And uh, if you have further questions for Melvin, you can catch us later on. Yeah? Sure. Thank you, Melvin. Um, next up, we have.